Well, I think maybe the question to ask, uh, I've got a number of opinions on, on, on these productions, but I don't, don't particularly need to talk about them. Uh, but I think the question to ask is, uh, clearly we saw one production, uh, which was the Met production, that many people sort of, in some ways, agree is a sort of, a, you know, a fairly um, sound, inoffensive production of the ring. It certainly doesn't have many ideas about it. And, uh, in it, it's sort of, yep. Uh, I can't, no, 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 it's, it's, no, no ideas is never good. You've got to have ideas. There's, there's got to be something that really sort of spurs it and makes it interesting and, 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 and perhaps unusual. And I think maybe my feeling about the, 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 uh, uh, the Gunter Schneider Simpson Otto Schenk ring is it, that it just sort of was there to try to please as many people in the audience as it possibly could. And maybe what one could say about both the Stuttgart and the Copenhagen production, and indeed we can say this about, uh, about many, many other productions one sees, particularly in Europe, is actually sort of the, that, that it, it, it took a stand on the, uh, the material. It gave us a particular point of view that was unusual and in fact in some ways startlingly modern in comparison to the sort of production that is basically there just to try to please the audience as uh, I think average audiences, if they were just given unchallenging material on stage, whether this be an opera or whether this be in spoken drama, will ultimately get bored. Average audiences are actually fairly well educated and actually really want to go to the theatre in order to be sort of stimulated by what they see. I think, in fact, uh, and I think this is particularly the case in opera. In opera, we have a, it's a peculiar situation because uh, everybody insists on a tiny, tiny, tiny repertoire that we can only, there are only about 40 operas that really we can do. After that, we're moving into sort of an, un, an, an unknown area. And I think one of the problems at the moment is, is that people are getting tremendously bored with just seeing the stuff that they've seen time and time again. And we have to have people coming in doing new versions like this just to revive what we insist upon being a and, very, very narrow repertoire. And, and yet, the. Um not, not that I'm the biggest defender of the Schneider Simpson ring. The Schneider Simpson ring was done uh, what, what, nine years of cycles, and every one of them was sold out. Every single one was sold out. So that would seem to argue against what you're saying. People were, people were not bored. Now, I personally think that a lot of the success of the Schneider Simpson ring had to do with other factors. Largely, I think, um, reaction against the, the Reggie Opera productions in Europe at the time. I think um, the, a huge number of the people at the Schneider Simpson rings were regularly Europeans mm -hmm. who were fleeing to the United States because they were tired of, of, of a certain kind of, of an opera production. But I don't think that um, boredom, I, I, I don't think that artistically to make choices to do a kind of production or kind of performance, I'm a performer, we're both performers, we're both stage performers in a way. And um, there's a lot of things that motivate what I decide to do and how I decide to do it. But I would hate to think that whatever motivates me to do is that I don't want to bore the audience. I mean, that's, that, I stress yeah. this in a singularly I, actually, uh, negative way. Yeah. I mean, my, my motivation is to try to, I have two motivations, basically. To be as faithful as I can to what I think the work means and to uh, excite, move, and uh, um, uh, transform, if possible, the, my listeners through my understanding of that work. And those are the only two things I care about. I, I think one thing one would say when was I, I direct both uh, spoken drama and opera. And when you eventually decide the work you're going to do, the first thing you do is not to say, oh, how can I do something entirely new that nobody has done before? What you actually do is you go into the work and you explore it in considerable detail and ultimately, along with your designer, because it really is a sort of a cooperative thing, you actually work out what you consider to be the sort of the, 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 the um, way of representing the play that most freshly represents your understanding of what it is. Uh, and in fact, it is sort of one's, one's, one's first um, reaction is not actually directed toward the audience at all. It's directed, this is the way in which the opera can be most excitingly represented. And then one of the great excitements of it is, 
is eventually you put it there in front of the audience and you don't know how they're going to respond. And that's the interesting thing. And one of the problems I have, and this is, I do have this problem with the, uh, sh uh, with the, the, the Schenck Schneider Seamson thing, and I have this problem with the Seattle Ring as well, because I, I have actually heard it being said that this is what the Seattle Ring was there for. We want to just bring these audiences who sort of, who, who just want to be sort of uh, not particularly offended by what we're doing. These audiences who, who, who really want to sort of go to a sort of a, a, a version of Wagner that's very generalized. Whereas it seems to me what we need to do is we need to sort of set both performers and audience sort of to a certain extent in friction against each other because it actually can produce tremendously exciting theater. Look at the Chirot ring was absolutely abominated in 1976 yes, when it was first I was done. There. It was, you, were, you were there. I, uh, I guarantee you that uh, Ed Chirot walked him. on the streets of Bayreuth oh, he in 1976. He would have, been, he would have he literally been, been killed. Been shot. I think yes, he would have been, been shot. murdered. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, the, especially among the French people who were there. The, the, <laughs> yes. the sentiment was un, indescribably uh, uh, um, uh, volatile. People were incredibly offended and, and um, angry, and myself included, by the way, some of the time. I, I think, though, that one should say that, in fact, I think most directors, and I certainly think this is the case with Hossi Vila, do not actually sort of set out by saying, we are going to offend the audience. What they do is they set out by saying, we want to represent this opera, this action, in the way that we feel is most uh, faithful to our vision of it. And it is really the combination of the original artist and the director that makes the interesting things. Shakespeare, by the way, would, no, would not be performed these days, for example, in the English-speaking world, if it hadn't been for Peter Brook and Peter Hall in the 1960s, who came out with totally, and the first time we went, he said, what are these people doing? But they revived Shakespeare. We should be very careful about saying, oh, these people don't know what they're doing. They all said Shero didn't know what he was doing. He damn well did know what he was doing. And sort of, just because we don't understand it doesn't mean to say... Well, oh, there's, a, there's another reason. We, we, uh, they don't know what I doing. wasn't going to say anything, and now I'm talking my head off. But there's yeah, another reason... To be I know. There's another reason, by the way, where I think that, that, that Simon is absolutely right, that we need to be very careful about saying um, they don't know what they're doing. And that's because it's the same way we use... It's the way we um, use language. We'll, we very often say about somebody, oh, he's crazy or she's crazy. Mm -hmm. And then when someone is truly crazy, we don't have any words left for it. <laughs> and and um, if, we, if every production that we don't like, we say they don't know what they're doing, then, for instance, because there's, there's I mean, if, if, by you, if, if by they don't know what they're doing, uh, what you mean is incompetence. Um, th th I mean, I have seen a, a truly, for, let me just make, uh, give my, I know we've said this before, but I'll say the difference, I hated the Schlingensee Parsifal. I thought it was appalling, but it was anything but incompetent, and the guy knows exactly, well, he's, poor man, he's dead. He knew exactly what he was doing. I just very, very much disliked and disapproved of it because I felt it really ultimately had nothing to do with at least what I think Parsifal has to do with. Um, and that it was perhaps dishonest because I'm not sure that, that many of the ideas didn't have, uh, have anything to do much to do with Parsifal either. I mean, we may see a production that we want, like Chirot. You, people saw, I saw the Chirot ring, and I would have liked to have him stoned at the time. Now I don't, but at the time, I would have, I would have, I would have, I would have been in there hurling the stones myself. But, but at no time did I think he doesn't know what he's doing. I didn't like what he did, but he knew exactly what he was doing and had very strong reasons for doing it. And I think that, that, that we have to be very careful that most of these directors are not incompetent. <laughs> That's for course. They cannibalize other people. Oh, sure. And there are always a certain period. But then, but then artists cannibalize from each other all the time. I mean, you know, playwrights cannibalize from each other. Composers do. It is sort of, it's a sort of a cultural network. It's a cultural tapestry. And each work can't be absolutely unique. I mean, we could say Francesco Zambello. Yes, yeah, she sort of was certainly directing in a tradition that comes from Carson and comes from Chereau. But one just has to sort of recognize that as a tradition. And you recognize this, oh, she got that from there. And I think you just have to sort of a, 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 accept that.
Yes. For, for 25 years, yes. everybody would have Exactly, yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, like, uh, James Morris, uh, I was incredibly moved by him. I thought particularly his answer to the third question about, you know, who rules the world was, was, was uh, uh, overwhelming. It was, just, it was marvelous. Uh, no, my argument just on this one was that, that nowadays, uh, given the, um, uh, the particularly contentious sort of um, uh, um, reactions that Siegfried in particular uh, uh, creates that I think you would find it difficult to put that particular production on in front of an audience of younger people, of people who are actually going to be going to the opera, we hope in 20 years time, when probably most of us are not going there any longer, we'd find it very difficult for younger people to accept something like that. They would find that it had no edge and they would actually find that the idealization of the hero, which is something I was doing here this morning, they would actually find that very difficult to come to terms with. And I find this is not something to get upset about and, 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 and condemnatory about. I find it's interesting. Because I don't think that, in fact, that, uh, that, that Otto Schenk production, if it was produced today, certainly in front of an audience of people who are probably in their 30s and their 40s, which is a realistic audience to expect, I don't, I don't think it would, it would actually um, even begin to interest them. Because this is in a theatrical style that is old-fashioned. They could still be very interested in the ring. I may, I'm not quite so sure which of the rings they would be interested in. I can remember, as I think I've mentioned before, going to the third cycle of the Akim Fryer ring in, uh, in Los Angeles, that in fact the whole Wagner establishment has sort of thrown up their arms in utter amazement and being surrounded by 3,000 young people. Actually, there were some older people there as well, but a vast number of young people, and it was one of the most exciting evenings, uh, four evenings, I have ever had in the theatre because they understood how the story was being told. They found this strange way of representing the ring to be extraordinarily exciting, and I came out thinking, there's the future of, uh, of, of, of opera. Unfortunately, they, they, they've sort of been left to go away because now we come back and we have, our, we have sort of a more regular repertoire that's not particularly exciting. So this is really what, 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 what I mean. I said it seems to me in some ways it's old-fashioned. It doesn't, in fact, sort of um, reflect the style, certainly, of younger people today or the, the taste of younger people today. When we came into the theatre, we saw operas from the point of view of the way in which they were directed at, at that time. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, that, that, that uh, you, you, I mean, if you see Shakespeare these days, if, you're, if you actually want to go and see Shakespeare done in um, Elizabethan dress in a classical way, you'll probably wait years to find a production because it's, because it's now being done in such a wide range. And Normally, when I, I go at the moment, I, I go to write a review. <laughs> I seem to re be about reviewing everything I see at the moment. And the, the answer to that one is, you concentrate on everything. But I'll tell you how I approach it. Uh, this is whenever I'm writing a review. And actually, uh, I go with a preconceived idea of what this is like. I actually go with the first paragraph of the review written, or in, written in my mind. Before I have even gone into the theatre, before, before I've even checked up on who is, 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 is um, singing at times, I have never yet actually written a review that has that first paragraph in my mind as it was. Because what I use that is, this is my idea of what this production should be. Now what I have to do is sit down there and see what somebody else's idea is. I'll give you one example. This is only a few, a few weeks ago. I had to review La Cenerentola down at the Los Angeles Opera. And I have a very, I'm very fond of the old Glyndebourne production of La Cenerentola with Peter Hall and it's in 18th century realism and everything. And I had seen all the pictures of this La Cenerentola and I was determined I was not going to like it. And so I went, I sort of, I composed in my mind a sort of a paragraph that clearly was going to throw this whole, I doubt, an ironic light on all this production. I went in there and it took that production about 15 minutes to get me round to its side. And once I got round to the side and realized it was doing something entirely different from what Peter Hall did, then I found I would really began to take notice of it from all sorts of different points of view. You know, but but I, I actually I'm particularly interested in the staging. But the thing is, is that what you do when you go into when you go in, we go in with our own ideas, but we have to actually allow what we see on the stage to change those ideas. Now, for example, rings. I actually um, 
don't particularly like, by the way, the Copenhagen ring. It's not my favorite thing. I didn't like the third act. Um, but I have been to certain ring productions, actually Friar was one of them, where I went in at the beginning and I was very confused by what I saw and I was rather angry by what I saw. When I see a Convictiony production, I'm always angry. At the end, I'm always convinced. Convictiony is a master on this. But what you have to do is, I think, you have to understand what you think and then open yourself up to what other people think. And the one thing is, if somebody does something that is different from the way you think it should be done, that doesn't mean to say it's wrong. Do you understand what I mean? And, and that, actually, I find, is, as a reviewer, is always the way in. You say, why did they do that? I wouldn't have done that. And if you can answer that question, then actually it's great. After that, you can really get in there and find other things. In the history of opera, in the history of, of all serious um, music and serious art, um, the, the money came from, from patrons. Um, whether the patron is, as in post-World yeah. War II Europe, has been the, the government yeah. until at least 10 or 15 years, until basically Angela Merker in the new era, um, or whether it was in the United States, uh, foundations, companies, that kind of patrons. But it was always basically patrons. And so the, the, what was played in the repertoire largely depended upon either the patron's taste or the patron's sense of the importance of what needed to be done for their own agenda. Very often the agenda had to do with the, the um, um, honor, the glamour, the, 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 what, what they were getting out of it in terms of image. And, and um, unfortunately, in today's world, the, um, um, we have a very difficult time identifying who our patrons are or should be. This is not just true in America anymore, it's more and more true. I run concert societies now in Europe, so I'm very aware of the funding is a different problem in Europe than it is here, but it's a more and more similar problem. More and more money coming from foundations and private donors, um, and um, less and less coming from, from the state. But when it does come from the state, it always comes with certain kinds of strings attached too. So um, it, really, it really just depends. It, it depends upon, for instance, um, an opera company in Germany today would be very hard pressed, I think, to have a very conventional repertoire because there's very strong pressure uh, um, to, to present a certain kind of, uh, um, you know, it would depend upon which, which theater. I mean, mm, that very much yeah. from theater to theater. I mean, you, but you have very strong, for instance, right now, because of uh, circumstances which probably most of you are fairly aware of, you have a situation where La Scala, which is his, for the last hundred years, the most, the, the, the most important Italian opera house, um, is doing very little Italian opera. And that's because the, the primary conductor there is Baron Boehm, who has no interest in Italian opera. Um, now, he's not going to be there much longer. <laughs> better but, not be. Well, <laughs> better not be. No. But, but it's, a, it's a very... It's, and, 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 and for instance, there was a big uh, uproar because, of course, in the Verdi year, also the Wagner year, the opening night performance was, was a Lohengrin. And they were screaming it should have been, uh, should have been Verdi. Um, well, you know, of course, the fact is, what about the Met? Uh, this is still a Wagner year next year. Um, does anybody else, I know that Mel does because she was at the discussion. How many, you know that the Met is doing no Wagner next year. Does anybody know when the last time the Met did no Wagner in a season was? You, I think you, you were there, we talked about it, so you know. Anybody want to hazard a guess who doesn't actually know? What? Uh, 1918. 1918. 1918 was the last time, and that wow. was because by Even government decree, no German music was played in the United States. That's no right. Beethoven was played yeah. either yeah, in 1918. That, that was the case in England. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wagner was played a lot at the Met during World War II yeah. because there was this propaganda war was, 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 yes. was Wagner yeah. ours or theirs? So we played tons of Wagner during World War II. Oh, sure. Uh, can I just sort of add one thing about the eco economy, about money? Uh, there's something that worries me a lot about the operatic world at the moment is the fact that opera companies are beginning to share productions. So production is done by three or four companies. Mm -hmm. Now, for a start, this actually reduces the amount of work available for directors and mm -hmm. designers that some people might think would be a good idea. But actually, I'm not quite so sure that it is because it means that good young directors have a lot of difficulty in getting in there. 
The other thing that really worries me about it is I wonder if it's actually beginning to, to actually affect the appeal of opera. I'll give you an example, and this is Wagnerian. Uh, a few weeks ago, actually about a couple of months ago, the Los Angeles Opera rec did its, uh, um, its Wagner centennial production of The Flying Dutchman. And they revived a Nicholas Lehnhoff production that had first been seen in Chicago and then was seen in San Francisco. And they brought it to Los Angeles and Nicholas Lehnhoff didn't come along. They shopped in somebody from Covent Garden, I think, who sort of came and put on, I have never seen anything quite so weak and mediocre in my life. And in fact, people I know who had seen the first production in Chicago said, oh, this is all right. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't one of Lehnhoff's productions. But because it was there, because they had this production, because it was going to save them money, they shopped in this production and gave a really actually shabby performance, I have to say. The only thing that was any good was the orchestra. The rest of it was really just sort of utterly weak and, 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 and unexciting. And a lot of people were deeply disappointed and are not going to go back. And I think this is one of the problems, that if we're constantly trying to cut money here, cut money here, to sort of just sort of have as sm a small a number of productions as possible, we're going to lose our audience. Well, I agree. There is only, in the 20th century, and now we're 13 years into the next one, there was only one person who actually um, could sing Siegfried pretty much without any problem, and that was Lawrence Melchior. Mm -hmm. And he died, or he stopped singing, what, 75 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, it's been a major problem. I mean, read, 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 read Kulshaw's book on the problems they had with the, and, and the, the Schulte ring. Yes. We always think of the Schulte ring is, is you look at the cast like of Gooder Dammering, and it's like, who's who are, who are the greatest singers of the 20th century? And yet, you know, Wolfgang Vingassen, who ends up being their Siegfried, was totally not who they wanted to cast. No. And, and we listen to Vingassen now and think, gosh, we, I wish we had, we, we had he had bad rhythm, but other than that, we wish we had him. But the fact of the matter is um, that Wagner probably made unreasonable demands on that role. Yeah. Um, uh, Tristan, too, but there have been more uh, satisfactory Tristans historically mm -hmm. than, than, um, uh, than uh, and, and the other role that is incredibly difficult is Tannhäuser. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. extraordinarily yeah. difficult to yeah, find actually. Uh, people to do that, mm -hmm. both for the demands it makes on the voice and for the fact that the role's a bit stupid. Yeah, it's not an attractive <laughs> role to sing. <laughs> yeah. I don't think any... Uh, it's, yeah. yeah. It has been done. Well, the person the who did it, been done. the ring's been done. There's that one that they did where it's really uh, abbreviated. Well, you know, there's there's different approaches to um, cutting Wagner, um, and the the one approach um, is is uh, absolutely typified by Arthur Bodansky. Um, Arthur Bodansky, who was the primary Wagner conductor at the Met in the 30s and 40s, during the wartime, uh, sort of together with um, 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 Eric Leinsdorf. But Eric Leinsdorf usually got also the festival performances. The Met's policy in, um, well, actually the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and, and I'm not sure about 50s, 20s, 30s, and 40s was that the Ring and Parsifal uh, that were done every season. Um, and they were done very heavily cut, but then they were done as, as festival performances at the end of the season once in which they were uncut. The, the only opera of Wagner which was always cut at the Met from Toscanini's time from 1909 until, um, well, until now, it was Tristan. Um, but Tristan was not cut, presumably, pr um, mostly for the reason that you're talking about, because of its length. It was cut because of the difficulty of the role of, of Tristan. Um, anyway, Bodansky's um, way of cutting, and Bodansky did a good, from your standpoint, a good job. I mean, like Meisterzinger, which is usually about four hours and 30 minutes of music, um, Bodansky cut down to just under three hours. Bodansky had a very simple policy. Every opera should start at eight o'clock, and every opera should be over before midnight, period. So you would cut enough to make this possible. And Bodansky was a master at cutting six bars here, and eight bars there, yeah, 16 bars good. here, and 20 bars there. Um, for me, personally, there is no punishment in purgatory bad enough for this man. 
Um, uh, because I find it utterly unlistable to you. never know when it's coming. I mean, you, it's like, you know, the other way of cutting Wagner is, is, is illustrated by, and this was true, it's amazing, until really the 1960s and 70s, is not to cut little snippets, but to cut big hunks. Um, the best examples is the, uh, how many of you know the Norwegian opera, Norwegian radio uh, uh, recording of Gudur Demerung? with Kristen Flagstad and Seth Svanholm. Anybody here have that? It, this is long disappeared, but it was issued, I think, on CD once. It was, um, Kristen Flagstad uh, insisted upon us being published by DECA as a condition for her agreeing to sing um, uh, Fricka in, in, the, in the DECA Rheingold. And, and even though that seems like a very small thing at that time, the name of Kristen Flagstad was, I thought, they thought was essential as, as to sell the record. Um, anyway, when they first got the, the, the tapes for it, and it was an absolutely standard European performance of a provincial performance of Gooder Damrick at the time, it was quite short because there were no Norns, no Valtrauta, no Alberich. Um, you know, if, if, if you cut huge scenes like that. It's just it, extracts. It, yes, it's, it's, it's basically extracts. But, but I have to say, from my personal standpoint, I would much rather hear Gunnar Demerung with the Norn scene eliminated, with the Valtraut narrative eliminated, with the orchestral interlude eliminated, with Alberich eliminated, rather than hear one of the Bodansky things where everybody's there, but every single passage is cut. Bodansky cuts the prize song. No, maybe, he, he doesn't cut the quintet, but he does cut the prize song. He cuts everything. Because it becomes a game. What can he can actually extract without you, you know, supposedly noticing it? Um, um, I, I, I personally have no interest. I, I, I never want to hear ever the Ring, Tristan, or Parsifal, or Meistersinger cut. If I can spend the rest of my life, if God grants me 25 or 30 more years, I hope I can spend them never 